This is the Bookwaves Artwaves Hour, interviews with writers on KPFA's nationally syndicated Bookwaves program, along with interviews about film and theater and archive book interviews that stretch back four decades. I'm your host, Richard Walensky. Today's program begins with a review of How I Learned What I Learned by August Wilson, which is now at TheaterWorks in Mountain View through February 3rd. Then we hear about the restored 1971 film Bushman, which will be shown at Pacific Film Archive on February 3rd and 24th with future theatrical and streaming releases. Today's program concludes with a review of the play Babes in Holand, which is at Shotgun Players' Ashby Stage through February 10th. Links to bookstore event calendars and updated links and listings to Bay Area live theater venues can be found on the kpfa.org webpage for today's show. Now on to the first review of today's Bookwaves Artwaves Hour. The great playwright August Wilson, often called America's Shakespeare, wrote ten plays that together are called the Pittsburgh Cycle. These plays include Fences, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, Gem of the Ocean, and Two Trains Running, the last of which was produced over at Marin Theater Company in 2022. But along with some early plays, both produced and unproduced, there's one more play beyond the cycle. That play, How I Learned What I Learned, a one-man show featuring Stephen Anthony Jones as August Wilson, runs at TheaterWorks Mountain View Center for the Performing Arts through February 3rd. While Wilson's cycle presented the black experience in America over the ten decades of the 20th century, it's seen mostly through the eyes and thoughts of the inhabitants of the Hill District of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. How I Learned What I Learned is August Wilson's own story, anecdotes and thoughts about growing up in a tough neighborhood of poor folks with a large black population and Italian and Jewish immigrants. Mainly focusing on his time as a teenager in the mid to late 1960s, we learn about his friends and acquaintances in the neighborhood, shop owners and thieves alike, and about all the jobs the young Frederick August Kittle Jr. had to take and lose on his way to becoming a playwright and poet. How I Learned What I Learned was written in 2002, three years before Wilson's death from cancer. What's startling is that all the contemporary references from 20 years ago are still contemporary. Culture hasn't changed much, despite all the technology. What's often forgotten about August Wilson is how damned entertaining his plays are. While Gem of the Ocean takes us on a spiritual journey from Africa to America past the Sea of Bones, or Two Trains Running deals with racism and poverty in a diner in 1968, they're also filled with vast amounts of humor. He's serious, but he's also funny. And it's that entertainment value that shines in this production. Wilson was a master raconteur, and Stephen Anthony Jones takes full advantage of his own skills to bring these stories to life. He is mesmerizing, whether standing or sitting or even dancing, illuminating Wilson's triumphs, failures, and the institutional racism and classism existing in Pittsburgh then and within these contradictory United States today. It's a can't-miss production with a can't-miss performance. How I Learned What I Learned by August Wilson, directed by Tim Bond, plays at TheaterWorks Mountain View Center for the Performing Arts through February 3rd. For more information, you can go to theaterworks.org. The TheaterWorks production, How I Learned What I Learned, will be performed free at Flax in Oakland on February 10th at 7.30 p.m. Tickets must be reserved in advance. You can go to oaklandtheaterproject.org for more information. I'm Rich Walensky on the Book Waves Art Waves Hour. Coming up now, today's interview recorded at Berkeley Art Museum Pacific Film Archive this past January 18th. My guests are Gail Shickley, producer, writer, editor, and environmentalist, Rob Nilsson, film director, actor, producer, and John Shibata, film archivist at 
Berkeley Art Museum Pacific Film Archive. On February 3rd and the 24th, they're going to be in a panel at Berkeley Art Museum Pacific Film Archive to show two films. One is called Bushman, and the other is called Give Me a Riddle. Give Me a Riddle is a documentary filmed in Nigeria in, I think, 66. Bushman was filmed in San Francisco in 68 and released in 71. Bushman was directed, and this is kind of the central film here, Bushman was directed by David Shickley, who Gail was married to until his death in 1999. He was a director. He was an actor. He's also the brother of Peter Shickley, who just died, who was better known as PDQ Bach. Gail Shickley, you met him at what point? Before he we went on the air, I asked about a friend of mine who knew him in the 60s, and that was before you knew him. So at what point did you come into the picture? I first met David in Denver, where I was working at a theater in the 70s, but I really didn't meet him and and uh, connect with him until the 92, when his film Tuscarora was at the Denver International Film Festival. And there was a talk back after, and nobody was there representing the film, but the a uh, story is about a open pit mining that was threatening a small Nevada town where there was a pottery school. And it was a wonderful talk back, but the EPA moderated, and a young woman stood up because the mining people were there, and they were saying how it really was. And she raised her hand and said, I just want to express on behalf of the townspeople of Tuscarora, I'm on their side. And the room burst into applause. And I called our mutual friend through whom we met, Burns Ellison, and said, oh, you got to call David and tell him this. He says, no, 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 you call David. <laughs> so that was my first big conversation with David on the phone. Shortly after, I was moving to California for a job on a newspaper, The Independent in Livermore. And I met David that week. And it was just absolutely love at first sight, the two of us. <laughs> and he greeted me with a big open embrace, you know, one arm up, one arm down, how he's always greeted everybody. And um, just had the heart of gold and was a person that, because he knew, uh, and I told him, you know, the things that I was interested in doing. And he works with people to help them realize their dreams. He was the best friend to so many artists and others in really listening to them and helping them realize, you can do this. You know, so I was one of those people and helping me move and, and get settled. It was not long before we were settling in together and we became engaged, you know, within six months and married within a year. So I want to go a little bit further back because as you were married to him, you learned quite a bit. So how did he become a director? What brought him to that? Because I'm sure he spoke to you about it a lot. He was very interested in film from the beginning, and he was a musician who was a violist. He didn't start till the age of 10, but he was conducting the Fargo-Moorhead Symphony, where the family lived in South Dakota, when he was 15 years old. And he ended up doing music for years. Where did his brother fit in? They worked as a team at one point? Well, they did. They really kind of discovered PDQ Bach together because they would do music and tapes. And there is an early tape of Sanka Cantata, a takeoff of on the Coffee Cantata. And David was a part of that. And they have a recording of that that's on Peter's Vanguard album. So that was when they were still teenagers. They were always doing music together. Peter went to Juilliard, and there were others there, like Philip Glass, and they would play each other's music. But David became a real master violist, and he toured for three years with Robert Shaw Corral. He worked in the pit of Radio City Music Hall. When he was working at Radio City Music Hall, this is in the early 60s, right across from the Rockefeller Center where he was learning film editing and doing that kind of work. So he was er interested early on. But it wasn't until fully immersing himself coming out here in 1964 and working with John Cordy. And they worked together on several films. Um, David worked in various capacities for him and other uh, filmmakers, both as a an editor, a composer, a producer, and director. So he was really immersed from that point on. 
At what point did the politics come in and going to the Peace Corps? So David was a conscientious objector. That wasn't going to happen for him. And so he knew he might be facing a couple of years in jail and learned about the Peace Corps. And he really didn't know anything about the Peace Corps. But he applied and he was accepted and had training at the University of Michigan, where importantly, he met Roger Landrum, who went with him. They were the second group to go to Nigeria, and it was a smaller group. And it was just 15 of them, and they were sent to the University of Nigeria in Sukkah, where he taught English. And they were trained at the University of Michigan, went there for the flagship years, 61, 63. Rob went on just a few years later and was in the eastern region, but they met there uh, during the Peace Corps. Rob Nilsson, were you at that point involved in film when you went there? Uh, no, no, I was a poet. I was a poet and an aspiring painter, but I was also a conscientious objector. And my road was going to SNCC to to work with the uh, people that had been uh, arrested for trying to trying to vote down there, but that wasn't sufficient to get me out of the out of the uh, Vietnam War, which I was not going to go under any circumstances. And so there was the Peace Corps, and so David and I met there when he was leaving in a, in a Peace Corps rest house, sixty three, I think it was. And he was on his way back, and I was away on the way in. Only a brief meeting at that time. When I got out of there, after two years, I spent a year painting and writing on Fernando Po, an island off the coast of uh, of West Africa, and met David again in the Peace Corps training program back in Boston, where I was broke. I, had, I was trying to drive cab, but I couldn't get a job to begin with. So Roger Landrum, who was mentioned here, put me into his Peace Corps training program, and all of a sudden, here show, David shows up to show me, give me a riddle unbelievable because I had no idea that anyone could capture what I'd lived. It was, well, it was cinema verite. So let's talk about that. Gail Shickley, did he talk about the origins of the film and how he came to write it and direct it, I mean? Well, yes, very much. In 1966, the Peace Corps wanted to make a film, the first Peace Corps film about the experience. And Sarge Shriver was the original head and was still head of the Peace Corps. But um, the associate director was Harris Wofford, who was counsel to Kennedy and King. And he was just an amazing man, later senator from Pennsylvania. But he championed David, and they became fast friends over the years. But he really pushed for David's version of it um, because Disney had an offer in to do a, a more PC film, dare I say. And they pushed, and Sarge Shriver agreed. And so David was able to go to Nigeria under the Peace Corps and do this film for Nigeria. So he really wanted to show the people in the towns and the villages and really what life was like and traveled all around the area of the Cross River and Calabar and Sukkah and the areas that he worked. And it featured Paul Opokum along with some others, Manji Giogu and, and some others that feature in the film. Paul Opokum was the star of Bushman, and that's a significant part, as we'll talk about. I will tell you that recently, Rob accompanied my son Night Train and I to Nigeria, where these films were screened. I had only talked to Paul once on the phone, but David and Paul were very close. And he never responded to my news about David's death. But he had a an assistant at the University of Calabar, where he was for all the years till he died, and it was the student that put us together on Facebook. And we were so elated. And this first Bay Elsa International Film Festival was supposed to play in 2020. And we were so excited about meeting Paul. And then Paul died. And then COVID. And so we finally got there in, in this past year. So he was alive up until 2018? 2019. 2019. Now, did he talk to either of you about how he met Paul. Paul was a student at the University of Nigeria in Sukkah. Was Paul an acting student? Yes, he became a theater teacher, and that was very much his, his life. But at the time, he was learning English, and later, he, of course, is the man that's featured in Bushman. 
later it was Roger Landrum and David that helped sponsor him to escape the Biafran War. We're going to go back to Paul in a little bit, but let's bring Rob in here again, Rob Nelson. So you meet him again. He's got the film, Give Me a Riddle. He showed the film at the Peace Corps training program that Roger was running. And I got his address because when I met this guy, I said, I've got to know this guy. Because I saw a film that that was unlike anything I could have imagined could be shot there. I mean, it's it's verite. Maybe here it seems old hat. Over there, you have you have your narrator, and everybody's explaining to you what the world is. And, and David was right there in the heart of it. And so then I moved back to California after I did my cab driving thing, where I met my wife in the cab, and we had a baby. <laughs> we took we went back, and I saw David in Sausalito, and I was making a film at the time of uh, Otto Preminger. On a set, it was kind of a spoof on Otto Preminger, and um, uh, he let me use his editing equipment, and, he, and we became li- lifelong friends within a short period of time, which is uh, to me a very high thing because David did not suffer fools. I mean, he was open to everybody, but to have, to be a friend meant you're a friend for life, and it was no it was no joke. And as Gail said, he was that, that was one of his great talents was how to conduct a friendship. And these friendships, of course, also resulted, in some cases, in my case, in movies which we collaborated on for the next number of years. How did Bushman come about? Were you there at the part of the initial discussion? No, no, I wasn't. That would be better to ask Gail about that. Roger Landrum, who's the interlocutor, forgive me a riddle, who worked as a teacher in Ninsuka with David, he sponsored Paul to come over to do the training in Boston in sixty mid sixties, and so he was teaching Peace Corps uh, students pigeon. <laughs> so he worked for the Peace Corps training and eventually made his way out here to San Francisco, where he became a theater student at the San Francisco State University. David wrote a script for him, and Paul were, helped work on that script, and they had a full script. Then you know began shooting. If either of you can answer, there are scenes from Nigeria in the film Bushman. Are those from uh, Give Me a Riddle? They're, they're from that, that material. As a matter of fact, David also let me use some of it for, for my picture, Heat and Sunlight, which, which won in Sundance in 79. And he's also in that. So he was generous, again, to, to friends and people he believed in. He had a two-hour film of Give Me a Riddle, and we right now have 67 minutes of it because that is what the Peace Corps, the Peace Corps didn't use the film because it wasn't quite PC enough, but the return Peace Corps volunteers, which are very active all over the world, use that film and do watch it, and it's lauded and appreciated for the beauty that it is. And I wanted to say when we were in Nigeria showing the film, they call it a national treasure. In Nigeria, it's considered one of the first films, if not the first film that they know of, ever made in Nigeria. And it's now, it's now Nollywood. So. And and Nollywood <laughs> be blossomed in the 1980s. So right. we're talking the 60s. And so to them, it's they called it a national treasure. We had several film people and directors and actors come to the festival that we attended last year. And we are going to give them that film at their request to be able to use in all their film programs in universities across this country. The film is getting filmed in a normal manner, actors and all of that. But also with a touch of documentary. And that's, that's of course, the genius of cinema verite. So it's an amalgam because David was a, a pioneer in that. There was cinema verite, but taking verite and putting it into drama... That's, it's subtle, but he was a pioneer. You're listening to an interview with Gail Shickley, Rob Nielsen, and John Shibata will join us. Gail was married to David Shickley, who was the director of Bush Band. And give me a riddle at BAM PFA, February 3rd and 24th. So I'm Richard Walensky on the Book Waves, Art Waves Hour. There are sequences where the character of Gabriel is just talking to the camera. Was that Paul as Gabriel talking, or was that Paul just talking about his own life? I'll bet it was an amalgam. What do you think? Absolute amalgam, because Gabriel was Paul, and some of the things that you see in there were very much him 
they're in the bar. There's all the pictures of the black people on posters. And he says, everything about them is white except their blackness, you know? <laughs> so David was always open to, you know, off script because that was his style. If it works, it works, you know? Were those sequences of him facing the camera, were those scripted or not, or don't you know? There was a full script, and they actually worked on it together. So I can't speak exactly to what section you're talking about. I imagine that some of it was uh, improv, and David decided in editing yeah, what to I, use. I, in, in the same way that Cassavetes was both scripted and improvisational. That brings up a question. Did he know Cassavetes? Well, he, he didn't know him personally. I, I knew him, but... But but uh, David never got a chance to meet him. But we were both aware of what, of what a uh, an amazing feat Cassavetes pulled off to change dialogue and and kind of much of the much of the behavior even in Hollywood films. You can even see it in in Spielberg stuff, or you, know, you can see it in Jaws. A different way of approaching how people speak, and it maybe it's scripted and maybe it isn't. And I'm sure that's partly both because they're trying to get it when it's you know wet and dripping, right? Something happened partway through filming, which was demonstrations at San Francisco State, which Paul got caught up in. Can either of you talk to David's own experience seeing his film suddenly blow up halfway or two-thirds of the way through filming and his decision to continue filming? I just read his diaries of that period, which Gail provided for me, of that time when Paul was arrested. And so I can see the, the levels of frustration and, and strategy and, and determination and fear and, and pain and stuff that he was experiencing as his friend of these years and, his, his, and also the, guy, the main guy in his movie is being manipulated by the United States justice system, so-called. And strategically, he got everybody involved that he could. W Willie Brown, who was an assemblyman, uh, came in to help him. Uh, there were lawyers. There were there were other filmmakers. There were m members of the uh, Black Panther Party, which uh, he had been. He had at least one member of the Black pa Panther Party in the movie. But David knew people in all walks of San Francisco life, including the Black Lives. And he had good friends in Richmond and people that ran bars and people from all walks of life. It was like a, like a tremendous puzzle that he had to put together to somehow save his friend who ends up in San Quentin. I mean, imagine that. I don't know how you get a guy who didn't have anything. They, they, they accused him of having a bomb. How you get that into San Quentin, I have no idea. Maybe, Gail, maybe you know. I, almost like when you can watch the film, and this comes on as a surprise, because it's so impactful of what happened. When Paul was arrested, everything was flown into a spin, and a lot of different things happened, but there was an opportunity that he might have been deported, but they didn't realize how much danger he was really in. And they were going to definitely nab somebody. Now, the San Francisco State strike was the longest student strike in history, even though there were several other places, Columbia, Harvard, you know, they were having these big strikes. But it went on for five months, and the Black Student Union and the Panthers and so on. And so it was a volatile, you know, turbulent time. That also showed up in David's filmmaking in the film war. He had a bodyguard because there he had to, you know, be careful in filming and be, you know, safe for the cast as they were doing everything. When Paul got picked up, picked him up on campus and planes closed police and told him to follow him into the bathroom in the meds education building, which he did, and they produced this can of the bomb, supposedly. It was a can, as I understand it, of spices and stuff. It was just such a minor thing. But Paul said, I've never seen that. And they said, yes, you had this. We got this from your pocket. And um, they put him in their squad car then outside. And they they laughed and they put the bomb on top of the car and set it off. Paul c counting down, wondering if he was going to be blown up. And it was just a little, you know, firework. I mean, it was nothing. That's when he was first taken to jail and then later to San Quentin. And so when that happened, David says in his writing, I worked all of 1969 on it, and he would visit two to three times a week in San Quentin with Paul. 
after that, he was just depressed and he didn't know what he could do with this film and he was so obsessed by it. And one of our dearest friends who was with him in those flagship years in Nigeria, Jenna Fleming, then Jenna Frank, because she and her husband were staff for the Peace Corps at that time. She gave him a modest check and said, get on with it. <laughs> and he also was able to get a grant through the American Film Institute. And so he was able to continue to work and followed, I think, very beautifully uh, the facts of what happened after that. What struck me about the film, watching it all these years later, and we're not, we don't really need to go into comparing fascism of the 60s to fascism of today, but what struck me in watching the film is that at the point where things change, it felt as if the film itself was be about to lag. I mean, it was very matter-of-fact slice of life of this Nigerian, and suddenly it becomes a drama, a major drama. And that shock turns what would have been an interesting film into a great film, I think. I think so, too. And, and But, that, you know, David was well-read, active in music and all forms of the arts. And so what's he going to do as a filmmaker? I, I, I get it. And, you know, he, he, he took a right turn because any great artist uh, thwarted like that is going to find something, and he and he. I think he found exactly the right tone to take it along the the level of now a, a documentary about how do we get how do we save this guy's life, and that's when I think for me the connection to twenty twenty four began to come in. In seeing the film recently, in its restored version, which I'm sure you both have, obviously, what are your thoughts looking back on it and comparing? that era 50 years ago to today. Rob Nelson. How to compare it to today? Well, you have society run amok in two different countries anyway today, Hamas and Israel. You have levels of almost religious intensity about I'm right and you're wrong, and, and you have racial issues, and you have personal issues that are, that sometimes you wonder, and, and issues about truth-telling that that uh, I think we had to worry back then about whether anyone was ever going to even report accurately what the Panthers said, what the other groups said, uh, such as SNCC and all of that. And the same thing is is true here. We now have Trump, and we have we have no way for people that haven't studied like David has and has some kind of idea through literature and through life. What does it seem like when you're telling the truth? When that is being completely destroyed or modified in some way, life is chaos. And I don't know. This seems to me, as far as the, the, uh, the national goes, that, that this thing is unprecedented. David was in a, a small area, area of a big revolt, for sure. But this one seems to me to be uh, much more dangerous because it's international. Yes, well, I like to think that things are better now. And in fact, in some ways, the fact that Bushman has become such a phenomenon to our great joy. We'll be talking to John in a moment. But it really speaks to the time is now. I think everything that's happened since COVID and you have, you know, all the movements from LGBTQ to, you know, Me Too and Black Lives Matter, people are very awake to these issues and seeing what's happening, especially what, what we do have politically happening around us now. It was more impossible in the 60s. And, you know, when you talk about the Panthers, David talked at length uh, on an airplane ride one time to Bobby Seale. He talked about how how really intelligent and brilliant the guy was and impressed he was by him. And there certainly were a lot of very good, you know, I wouldn't want to say anything negative about the Panthers in terms of the good work that they were doing or felt they needed to do at that time. Although the violence is always a problem, no matter what, what you're doing. But the way David took the film, I thought he dealt with it just so beautifully in showing without having to even take sides, just showing the facts. They speak for themselves. 1971 comes and goes. Where was it shown? What kind of reception did it get? Does it get any kind of commercial release at that point? 
No, it never really had a commercial release. This is David doing it himself, pretty much. He did have a distributor later, but it did win in 71 when it came out. The Gold Who You Go is the best first feature in Chicago and a cash prize finalist at the Regional Cinema Competition in Utah. And it was at other festivals, San Francisco, Filmex, uh, L.A., Dallas, Atlanta, Washington, London, Venice, Florence, Adelaide. So it showed at a lot of festivals around the world at the time, but never received the follow-up and this what we're seeing now. John Shabata, let's take over from there. So the film gets shown. David kind of moves on to his next film. Rob moves on to his very extended career, which was just getting started then. How did you find out about Bush Band? And then take us through the steps that get us closer to where we are today. Yeah, I started working at BAM PFA in 1994 as a film archivist and didn't know anything about Bushman at the time. I probably saw it on some inventory lists, but just didn't know what it was. But in 1999, the film was somehow programmed in our exhibition program. I think it was a tribute to Albert Johnson at the time. But David Shickley was in person for that screening. As the film archivist, I was the one to go to the film vault, take the film off the shelf, and bring it in. It's a film I knew nothing about. But at the time, I was really interested in African cinema. So I was watching just everything I could get my hands on uh, at the Berkeley Public Library, uh, California Newsreel distributed distributed a lot of African films on VHS. And so I was watching a lot of those. And then when I read the, the, the description about Bushman, it really intrigued me to see this film about an African immigrant in the U.S., independent production. And so I went to the screening and was completely blown away by Bushman. I'd never heard of it before. I mean, I'd seen a lot of independent American cinema, especially from the 80s, growing up through the 80s like Gus Van Sant films, Jim Jarmusch, but seeing Bushman, a film from 71, the way it was shot, the cinematography, black and white cinematography, was so lush and beautiful and captured San Francisco of the time. There was a certain energy and dynamism to the way the film was edited, the way the sound design was put together, the music was really beautiful, and just all the characters had this life and sense of humor as well that just completely absorbed me and then after the film screening in 99 David was there and there was this really lively discussion with it seemed like half the audience knew David or worked on the film itself I guess Gail was there Rob was there I didn't like know anybody at the time I was just this kind of a kid but really just falling in love with Bushman so it's always been since that day the film's been on my mind or on the back of my mind is this is a very important film to my mind no one really knew about except for this small community here over the years i mean we've, we're always like applying for funding to preserve films but we mostly what what kind of condition was the film in when you saw it in 99 and it was just on i guess 16 or no, 30 it's a, so it's a 35 it's a 35 millimeter print it was it is it was david shickley's personal print on oh, deposit yeah. And I think it, I mean, it's in very good condition. Yeah, I think it had been not projected particularly much, and we kept it in our storage vault, so it was under good condition. So what kind of restoration had to be done on it? To do a, a, a good restoration, you want to go back to the most primary source materials if possible. So this is just a print that we had, but we didn't have the negative, the original negative. So as far as doing restoration on this film. We, we wouldn't do the best job if we just kind of went from the print and tried to make a copy. So while I always thought this would be a great film to eventually do a restoration, uh, we have so many other films we're dealing with as well, uh, usually like experimental shorter films, uh, that this kind of was always on the back burner or is on my mind as something that, you know, hopefully we can take care of. And it wasn't until fairly recently, I think just a little bit before the pandemic, Buck Beto at Movet Film Transfer in San Francisco reached out to me saying, you know, there's this woman here, Gail Shickley, with uh, a film called Bushman. She has the original negative <laughs> and original soundtrack negative. She wants to get it digitized. And Buck, you know, thankfully thought they could do the 
transfer, but they but Buck thought it should be a potential bigger restoration project where he could just do a full blown kind of job on it. We got in touch with Gail. You're listening to an interview with Gail Shickley, Rob Nielsen, and John Shibata. Gail was married to David Shickley, who was the director of Bush Band. And give me a riddle at BAM PFA, February 3rd and 24th. So I'm Richard Walensky on the Book Waves, Art Waves Hour. So John called me to my relief because I had been looking for and trying to figure out what to do. David was an archivist himself, and I had so many boxes and just so much material and, and other films, you know, give me a riddle as well. So he and at the time Antonella Bonfanti called me and uh, said that they were interested in, in restoring this film, and I was just like, my dream was coming true. <laughs> and so they said, should we bring a car or the van? I said, bring the van. <laughs> and because I also gave them all of Give Me a Riddle, saying, you know, this is the perfect companion piece, which no one was really interested at that yet, quite for Give Me a Riddle, till everyone realized it's the perfect companion piece. Because to see that film before Bushman puts so much in context of what, you know, the whole Nigerian experience is. And it's a Nigeria that doesn't exist anymore either. I mean, so it's really a time capsule, the Give Me a Riddle. And then to see that juxtapose against uh, Bushman, which which importantly, David wanted to turn the typical novel, you know, the Dark Continent, you know, Passage to India on its ear by where you usually have a civilized man going into a primitive culture and, you know, dealing with that. And here you have a civilized African coming in the tumultuous times of the 1960s, right in the heart of the Fillmore. It really was something accomplished. Rob Nilsson, in 1972, you and David went to Nigeria and met up with Paul and showed him the film. What did he think, and what was it like seeing Paul after the last time when he'd, the last thing you saw of him was being carted off uh, being deported. We showed the movie in a schoolyard at night with a, with a, an old generator and a, and a, a Peace Corps projector, and I was taking pictures. So I have pictures of Paul looking at at the movie. They're very poignant. And as far as we know, he never said anything to anyone, to David or to me, about what he thought. When David was knew he was dying, he wrote a book to Night Train, our son. It's called Letter to Night Train, and it's a number of stories about his life, and he writes about Biafra in that, and he says that the entire time he was there, Paul never said a word about the San Francisco, uh, San Quentin, or about the film, and he felt that he was just, as he says in his story, just too much to, in his life, it was such a horror in his life that he just couldn't talk about it. Bushman gets restored, and it's shown in different places because they did some research. This is not the first showing of the restored version. From here on out, some people can't make it on February 3rd or 24th, or people are listening outside the area. Is it going to be distributed and pop up say, on Canopy or Criterion? Is there any move toward getting it so more people could see it? Kino Lorber is distributing the films. Let's move on from Bushman. I want to talk to Rob Nilsson because you have a long and very distinguished career in the world of independent, very independent films. Um, I was looking at the resume, and it's quite long. Northern Lights was Northern the first? Northern Lights was the first, yeah. That was... Uh... Northern Lights was Northern Lights was seventy nine, Camera Door at, at Con was the award that we won. Following that, you played the lead and was the director of films Heat and Sunlight. Heat and Sunlight. Heat and Sunlight was the one that won at uh, Sundance in nineteen eighty eight. Did that ever get any commercial release? A little bit, not a lot. <laughs> you know, we you know we uh, I'm making a film every year, and so. In order to stop and become a, a distributor, sometimes a little inconvenient. So you think, well, the system should work. You know, here they won, they won these awards and stuff. Well, the system does what it wants to do, 
And I only do what I want to do. So I, I elected to be making. So now I've done about 45, 46 feature films. And, but this year now, I've become becoming a distributor. I recently had an offer from a big company to do them all. And when I looked at the contract, I said, thank you very much. I think I'll, I think I'll roll my own, if you don't mind. And so that's what I'm doing this year uh, and for the next few years to get all this stuff out there. Can you talk about the series of films you did about the homeless? I worked in the San Francisco Tenderloin for about 12 years, uh, working with workshops of, of people who showed up, all comers, free workshops, uh, in in what I call direct action, which is a way of way of preparing people for an improvisational style of, of dramatic uh, cinema. And so we made uh, nine at night, nine films that start at 9 p.m., about 40 to 50 different characters on the edges of society read the Tenderloin. That was one of the great 10, ten years of my life with all the people I met and all the people I still know. And I did the same thing around the world uh, in places like Japan and South Africa and uh, Italy and about seven or eight places with a workshop idea like that where you take real people and you just assume that that's what cinema is supposed to be about. Why do we need all of the the uh, accoutrement of actors and 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 twenty twenty trucks and fifteen unions? Why don't we get down the street? And and David was one of the progenitors of that idea, along with Cassavetes. And I got to meet John Cassavetes, and all the more became convinced that the cinema is all around us. Right here, this is a, this is a cinema scene. We don't have a camera, but uh, it can be made out of whole cloth almost anywhere you are, and that's that's been my idea. The idea is is to break it down into into scenes and and to build from those outlines backstory improvisations with your players. So the, it isn't just that they come and then be themselves. No, it's a, it's a much more involved system than that, but it's based on them. I, it's all, it's, if you want to call it that, it's all, it's all um, well, it's, it, whatever the term is. I mean, it's, I don't try to find somebody that's going to be like that. Oh, yeah. So I'm going to find people that are like this right now, and I can see, and we can all see together as a workshop. We, we fashion it together. With, with all the interactions that we have through the emotional exercises that we go through, and then eventually the story becomes apparent to us. And now we have to, to do backstory improvs with cameras so that when we start the film, we're just doing the same thing we were doing before. And it's all, the, the, one of the major things about it too is to overcome fear. Yeah, pretty soon people, the, the, the camera means nothing to them. They can even they can even go like that a little bit because maybe they know that they like the three quarter better than a straight. Line. I mean, I'm exaggerating a bit because that's not what they're thinking about. But so it would be kind of say if I took the recording, the raw recording, not what airs edited, of us, mm -hmm. and then you said do it again, and then maybe a third time, and then you write out a script. And then you look at each of the players and begin to no, talk about backstory? Any, no, no, I don't write any scripts. I mean, I don't write scripts for people. I write a script for myself and to some extent for me to understand what it's all about. But mostly we work from an outline that comes, if, if there was a screenplay, we'll put that over here. Now we have the outline so we know basically where what the character's doing in what order. And then... Once you have that, then you start, let's start before the story. Let's, let's see what it was like when you first met Billy in a bar. It was, it was like whatever it is, you create a circumstances. Or you go to a bar and you shoot it in a bar. If it happened in the street, you go to a street. With that, then you start to get the idea of who you are, not by talking about it, but by doing it. When you're working down with everybody's coming for free and nobody gets paid, including me, you've got the freedom not to have to, to work for the money, because there isn't any money. There's only interest and passion and the reality of lives as we live them. A lot of this, these ideas go back to Cassavetes. What are a couple of Cassavetes' films that people could see 
that show this kind of principle in action? Yeah, well, the first one would be Shadows, which which he made in New York City in okay. 69, I think it was. Uh, and he he was on the radio and said, hey, we're making a movie. And uh, if you want, uh, come down to blankety blank. And, and he had a workshop and made that film. And then Faces. is a, I would say those two are the most pure. A Woman Under the Influence is another. That was the last interesting film he made. He made nine and I... John and I both agreed that his first five were where were, were he was really finding it. And later on, it was less interesting. Uh, well, much like Cassavetes, in order to live and finance yourself, you also did commercial direction and acting a little bit. Very little. I did. I did. Yeah, I was on my Miami Vice and my, Beverly Hills 90120, was it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, these were silly little things that my friend uh, Bobby Roth, the director, he'd get me in. David, too. He'd, he'd have David uh, and, and I give us roles who made a little money. But no, I, I I did do one. I did Thomas Turned to Dust, which was a Rod Serling script that um, that was I got to adapt to to film for... Uh, USA Network. There so. you go. Yeah, no, you're ahead of me. I can't <laughs> even remember half of the things I've done, but thank you very much for that. But no, I tried to stay away from it because it, it dulls the instrument. You're, well, you're working for a different reason. Though. If I paint a picture, I, 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 loved, I loved Caravaggio, say, but I'm not trying to be Caravaggio. I'm trying to, trying to be as, as in, intensely myself as he was himself. And that's what, what I think an artist does and what I tried to do in cinema, with a little help from my friends, to, do, to be honest, because you can't make a film by yourself. Well, Rob Nilsson, you also did a documentary on Trotsky called What Happened Here? <laughs> yes, I did. I, we were early on in a, in a film collective here called, called Cine Manifest, and it was, uh, it was designed to do films about working people. So I, we got involved in reading, and I, I was not too aware of the radical history of the U.S., but I got interested in Trotsky years ago, and I read everything that I could ever find about him as, as a person with this deep uh, sense of, of, of responsibility to life. And he, he grew up on a farm, and he, he would weep by the way his father treated his, the, his, his serfs and uh, spent his whole life trying to see if there couldn't be a socialist reality that would work. And of course, he ended up being assassinated, and by the uh, by the very people, one of the very people that he was associated with, trying to create this ideal society. You're listening to an interview with Gail Shickley, Rob Nielsen, and John Shibata. Gail was married to David Shickley, who was the director of Bush Band. And give me a riddle at. BAM PFA, February 3rd and 24th. So I'm Richard Walensky on the Book Waves, Art Waves Hour. For all of those films, one a year for so many years, if people are listening and they want to see them, is there any way for them to see them? Or are they available, say, on DVD that people could send for? They, my, my, uh, as I was saying before, I'm, I'm creating now a system for myself for everybody in, involved too, whereby you're going to be, be able to see hopefully within the next by the end of a year year from now a couple of years all of them will be on a particular website that i'm now raising money to try to create and anybody out there who wants to uh you know consider it you can talk to can you give a uh, a, a website or email address sure um r nilson n-i-l-s-o-n at Rob Nilsson.com. Love to hear from people who are interested because that's where we're going now. After all these years, we're going to roll our own, as I said, and then make it, make it possible for all anyone to see them, most particularly the ones that were in it. To my son, Night Train, who will be with us for the February 3rd screening, was in several of, of Rob's films, most recently his trilogy, uh, the Nomad Trilogy. Do you have people watch what's going on, or is it just very private among the actors or performers, whatever you want to call them? In our workshops, which we did once a, once a week for 12 years, I never allowed anyone to come in except one time, and it was a reporter. And it was a, it was a disaster. And why? I don't know. 
that there's I never had one where someone didn't do something so remarkable, so so perfectly human that you you couldn't believe it. And this was the one time he could. And but I but I only took him on because I kind of knew him vaguely, and I would never do it again. Uh, it's it's so personal and private, and and people with uh, people standing around, you get distracted. And what I want is total concentration, but total relaxation at the same time. And that's difficult with uh, people standing around gawking. Well, I have you here, John Shabbat. I'm always a couple of minutes. What exactly does a film archivist do at BAM PFA? And what are a couple of the finds, like the 1999 find of Bushman, that you've made and you're going, wow. I can't believe we have this. What do we do now? Well, Film Archivist is basically taking care. Uh, we have a collection of uh, over 18,000 films and videotapes. They're stored in a climate-controlled facility off-site. So I manage the vaults, deal with all potential acquisitions. So whenever somebody has a film collection, uh, I mean, in collaboration with the curators, we determine if a collection or if films are worth taking in to become a permanent museum collection. I help raise funding and also kind of decide what films might be worthy of preservation from our collection, usually looking at what we actually hold as far as original elements. And it's, about, it's all mainly about providing access to the film collection. Is there any recent film you've stumbled across? We recently acquired the collection of a local filmmaker named Al Wong, primarily in the experimental mode. And there was a film called Twin Peaks, made prior to David Lynch's Twin Peaks. It's like a late 70s film. And over the course of the year, Al Wong drove his VW bus on Twin Peaks. There's like a, he calls it an infinity loop, but it's basically like a figure eight. He had his camera mounted, permanently mounted on his VW. He lived in the foothills of Twin Peaks, and when he saw the light, he'd drive up there and film. And the film is like an hour-long montage and is kind of cut seamlessly from section to section, depending on the seasons and the days he was up there. Are you involved directly with some of the technological areas of film restoration? Is AI getting involved? Is that something that you deal with? I'm not dealing with AI at all, and most of the technical work is done at off-site laboratories. So there are several labs that we work with. Like on for Bushman, we worked with Illuminate down in Southern California. They did the digital 4K scan, and also Photochem, who did the the photochemical 35 millimeter restoration. So the technical work I do is mainly prior to the labs receiving material kind of inspecting the films to see, you know, trying to identify what is the best available element for the project, and then also doing QC of the lab work after they've done the technical work. I want to finish up, round up a little bit with the rest of David's life. How many movies did he make after Bushman? David did one other feature film called Tuscarora, through which sure. we met. But he did about 30 corporate films, so he was always busy working on those films. And then he worked on a lot of other people's films, John Cordy and Gene Corn, Steve Wax, several other films on which he was either director, editor, composer. I know he did music for Energies of Love for John Cordy and for Rob Nielsen's Heat and Sunlight. So he was always involved on projects. How did he die? From cancer, the eventually brain cancer. Was yeah. it fast? Slow? It was both of those things because our son was only three months old when he was diagnosed, and we went through two years of every possible thing and really, really thought we'd beat it. But the, since it had already metastasized from the kidney, Originally, it just wasn't going to give up. So he lived four and a half years. His son does remember him, but Train was only four and a half when he died. Bushman, along with Give Me a Riddle, will be at BAM PFA, Berkeley Art Museum, Pacific Film Archive, February 3rd and 24th. And for more information, you can go to bampfa.org. That's B A M P F A dot O R G. Special thanks to A.J. Fox and Susan Oxtoby for their assistance on this interview. Bushman will be distributed theatrically via Kino, Lorber, and Milestone Films. 
I'm Richard Walensky on the Book Waves Art Waves Hour. Coming up now, the second review of today's program. Inclusive representation matters. On stage, only in recent years has what we see in footlights caught up with the diverse reality of the world around us. That first love affair, that first time in college, for instance, when we see it on stage, it's usually the white, straight, central characters with the black, gay ones as their support. So it's refreshing to see the reversal of that in Babes in Holand by Deneen Reynolds Knott at Shotgun Players, extended through February 10th. It's 1996 at a predominantly white college in Pittsburgh, and two black women students meet and slowly fall in love. The set is a realistic dorm room where one of them, Ciara, rooms with Kat, a white student having boyfriend trouble. As with most college roommate situations, things get hectic as one gains a partner and the other loses one. And nobody really likes to be told to leave so the roommate can canoodle. For those needing representation, or for those waxing nostalgic for dorm room antics and first loves, Babes in Holand holds some promise. But representation ultimately is not enough. There needs to be drama. Ciara is just now awakening to her lesbian side. For women today, as in 1996, this is both glorious and traumatic. For Ciara, it's no big deal. What role does being black play in that dynamic? For both Ciara and her new love, Taryn, no big deal. Outing yourself to parents and friends, not even mentioned. There's lip service to feminism, to racism, to school subjects. Topics are brought up only to die a moment later. It's a play of chit-chat, as the three actresses, Tierra Allen, Sundiata Ayindi, and Sierra Ells, work overtime to fill in the script's quotidian dialogue with furtive glances and nonverbal responses. Occasionally, someone says the wrong thing, but not even that can generate much drama. Babes in Holand contains a series of very short scenes requiring every dorm room entrance and exit to include clothing and shoe changes, often taking longer than the dialogue in the scene itself, and it's extended further by blackouts between each scene and punk dancing segments that go on and on and on. At 80 minutes, the story of two young women of color finding each other in a college setting might have been very sweet indeed, but sadly, Babes in Holand clocks in with intermission at almost two and a half hours. Babes in Holand plays at Shotgun Players Ashby Stage, extended through February 10th. For more information, you can go to shotgunplayers.org. Until next week, I'm Richard Walensky on the Bookwaves Artwaves Hour. Hey, don't trade it for peanuts. Donate your old car to KPFA and get the full tax write off. Vehicle donations are a win-win for everyone. They're the perfect way to support KPFA. Put your unwanted car, boat, motorhome, or truck to good use. It's easier than selling it, and you'll get a tax receipt for your records. Donating your vehicle to KPFA is really easy, and it only takes three steps. One. Have your VIN number and the title to your car handy. Two. Call the Car Donation Center at 877-411-3662 or fill out the Donate Now form online at kpfa.org to schedule a convenient time to pick up your vehicle. Three. Give the tow truck driver your signed title and, of course, the keys. And that's it. When your vehicle sells, you'll receive a thank you letter and an IRS tax form 1098. Thank you for supporting community-powered KPFA. For 75 years, KPFA has presented progressive voices who spoke truth to power. Odetta. Odetta, you were one of the first women I ever saw wearing an afro. I first saw it on a dancer by the name of Jenny Lagon in Los Angeles. And when she did programs of African lore, she would have her hair in natural. And I remember running into her at City College in Los Angeles. 
and uh, she was getting ready to do a program, and she had that natural. I said, hey, Jenny, and, but, and I was talking to her, but I couldn't keep my eyes away from her hair. 94.1 FM, 75 years of building community trust. Support us today at kpfa.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online worldwide at kpfa.org.